In this lecture segment, we continue our discussion of contemporary art with a focus on works of art from the 21st century and the concepts that connect this diverse production. The themes of postmodern and contemporary art that we discussed in the 1980s and 1990s continue in this lecture. The story of art in the 21st century is still being written and processed by scholars, curators, and critics. Art made today is vast and diverse, from artists like New York-based duo Dave and Gabe, who create interactive sound and light installations, often working collaboratively to produce works like this, a huge bubble viewer's touch that responds to contact with sound and light. We'll talk about artists who paint or use unusual materials or techniques, who create temporary works intended for destruction, who create art in cities outside of museum or gallery spaces. These artists use their knowledge of what came before to ask questions about the world, to critique structures of power, to reveal issues in societies today, and to try and build understanding across borders and amongst nations. American artist Kara Walker is an art professor from an artistic family who works in a variety of media, including paper cutting, creating silhouettes, reviving a traditional medium that was popular in 18th and 19th century Europe. She often creates large-scale installations of paper cuttings that use history to draw attention to racism in the contemporary world. She created this work in 2007 to be a cover for the New Yorker magazine. She had just had a show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art after the deluge, that was about New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, even though all of the works of art in the show were created before the hurricane. The show dealt with racism and poverty, two significant themes of Katrina and its effects. In this cut paper work for the cover of the magazine, Walker used her chosen medium to show the people of New Orleans in the throes of Hurricane Katrina. Aspects of this work are familiar to us. She uses the pyramidal composition of Jericho's Raft of the Medusa, showing, us, showing the figures extending, reaching, trying to get help, their arms like those in Jericho's, adding to the diagonal, stretching to draw the attention of anyone who can provide aid. Her forms echo those of Jericho, the figure holding the deceased body, another body extending into the viewer's space. Walker includes not just men, but also women and children, varied ages and body types, as they respond to the flooding and the desperate need for help at the Superdome in New Orleans and from the roofs of people's flooded homes. One of the approaches contemporary artists take is to use history to magnify, expand, or broadcast their critiques of the present. When we talked about Jericho, we explored the story of the Medusa survivors and how the painting was an indictment of a king who had appointed an inept captain who not only sunk the ship but made terrible decisions that resulted in loss of life. Walker uses this early 19th century painted critique to express a similar indictment of the then President of the United States who appointed a FEMA chief who had little experience in disaster relief and who bungled the government's delayed response to the disaster which caused more suffering and loss. This is the power of art history. With simple borrowings, appropriations from the past, the artist heightens the message of the work in the present. Kahinda Wiley was born in LA and studied art in college, earning an MFA in 2001. He's a contemporary portrait painter and painted former President Barack Obama's official portrait. He uses his knowledge of art history to magnify the effect of his work and to call attention to contemporary inequalities. He makes art that reveals white privilege, taking on a challenging topic. In this painting, he bases his work on Jacques-Louis David's depiction of Napoleon crossing the Alps that we briefly talked about in Neoclassicism. But instead of showing the white hero, the white European male emperor, he recasts the role and paints an African-American man astride the horse, controlling the great powerful animal. He paints real people and finds his models using what he calls street casting, approaching a potential model on the street. He changes some aspects of the costume compared to, compared to the David, like dressing his figure in camo with wristbands and a bandana, perhaps showing what the model was actually wearing, and keeps others, like the swirling dynamic yellow cape, the sword, and the blue tail and keeps the inscriptions of the names of lauded European leaders from the past engraved into the rocks. As Western viewers, we are accustomed to seeing white men in positions of power. Wiley dispenses with that deeply ingrained tradition and gives us something different and jarring for some. He is trying to show black men in positions of power, in part so that contemporary viewers can become accustomed to seeing not just white men in these roles. Wiley stated, painting is about the world that we live in. Black men live in the world. My choice is to include them. This is my way of saying yes to us. 
He uses his art to reveal white privilege, and considering that the average museum visitor is a middle-aged white woman, his art can help shift the way people expect the world to be and help them to see other stories and potentials. New York-based Chinese-born artist Wenda Gu similarly uses his work to help viewers reconsider how they understand the world. In this photo, we see the artist creating calligraphy with algae-pigmented water. Gu was trained in the Chinese landscape tradition and in calligraphy, using that knowledge in this artistic action to call attention to significant problems with toxic algae blooms in China. This work by Gu is owned by the Spencer Museum of Art at KU. You can get an idea of the scale of the work here. We see three panels displayed as if they were hanging scrolls, a common format for Chinese paintings. They appear to be covered in language, so if we go to the English panel on the left and try to make sense of it, we find that we can't. We've got M-U-S-T-T, W-O-E-R-D-S, N-E-I, it's English E, but it is not actually English. These are not real words. The same can be said of the panel on the right, which shows unreadable characters that appear to be Chinese, but derive from an old type of script. In the center, we see a single character that merges aspects of English and Chinese to create yet another unreadable symbol. Gu entitled the work Metamorphoses to refer to the meeting of cultures and the inevitable misunderstandings and confusion that results. But from their interaction, something new and different is born, like the character in the central panel. The medium Gu used to create this work and much of his production is primarily human hair, collected from salon and barbershop floors in China and the U.S. Hair has loads of different meanings, from the icky stuff in the drain of a hotel shower to expresses, uh, expressions of individual or ethnic identity to spiritual import. And Gu draws on these wide associations in creating a work of art made of this personal substance. The Englishy panel is made of Chinese hair, and the Chinesey panel is made of American hair, and the central panel is made of a blend of hair from China and the U.S. Hair is both attractive and repulsive, here transformed into art for a museum, recontextualizing a material from the human body or the barbershop floor, as the medium helps to deepen and communicate the meaning of the work. In some respects, this work is like an essay in what it is to be a global contemporary artist today. KU professor David Kataforis, writing about Gu, suggests that the artist's dual identity and back-and-forth movement between China and the U.S. is reflected in the material and content of the work. Ai Weiwei is also a Chinese-born artist who works internationally today, currently based in Berlin and Beijing. Like Gu, Ai's work is concerned with issues in the contemporary world, but he is more vocally activist in his art and in social media. The image you see here documents a performance piece in which he bought a 2,000-year-old Han Dynasty vase and destroyed it to make a statement about the Chinese government's relationship with history and cultural memory. He works in a variety of media, including site-specific works like this one, Good Fences Make Good Neighbors, from 2017 to 2018. The project was commissioned by the Public Art Fund for varied sites in all five boroughs of New York City, as you see on this map. I explained the project and what he feels is the necessity of drawing attention to issues of boundaries and borders and global migration. He says, When the Berlin Wall fell, there were 11 countries with border fences and walls. By 2016, that number had increased to 70. We are witnessing a rise in nationalism, an increase in the closure of borders, and an exclusionary attitude towards migrants and refugees, the victims of war, and the casualties of globalization. Extensions of the trends we saw in environmental art, I bases each separate installation on the demands of a particular site. It is also a work of public art, works of art outside of the museum that regular folks can experience and become part of the work. Portions of fencing, banners, and cages strewn throughout the city relate to places significant in his biography, and also those important in New York City's story of immigration. At Washington Square, he uses the triumphal arch form as the focus of his art, which consists of a 37-foot steel cage with the silhouette of mirrored human figures under the arch. Like we saw with Roman triumphal arches, this one also honors the accomplishment of a leader, in this case George Washington, but I uses it to help spark a public dialogue about fences and borders and who belongs where and who should decide. This arch honors the founding of American democracy, and with the cage form underneath, I asks questions about that democracy. He references his experience as a refugee as a child and as an adult immigrant. 
we have a work of art that is deeply activist in nature as he advocates for human rights by giving viewers the experience of being in a cage. He draws on the contributions of many of the isms, movements, and trends of the 20th century to use art to affect reflection and change, to question power. Our last work of art for the semester is a site-specific work from the spring of 2019 by an anonymous French street artist named J.R., who was born in 1983. Street art as a category includes stickers, pastings, and graffiti, works that respond to the elements like Smithson's Spiral Jetty, and that also often critique power structures outside of the museum and gallery system. JR designed this work for the main entrance to the Louvre designed by I.M. Pei. It consists of 2,000 strips of paper pasted to the site, a huge collage installed by 400 volunteers. When completed, the work made it look like the Louvre Great Pyramid was in the middle of a construction site in a quarry. He takes many of the art history lessons we've talked about, perspective and illusionism, digital materials and computer-aided imagery, everyday materials, entropy and the effects of nature, art objects that can disappear, and combines them together to create a work that lasted only a few hours before tourists and visitors had destroyed it through walking and tearing to extract souvenirs. For J.R., this was what he expected and planned for the work of art. For him, the work was a process, not necessarily the final product. So we've come full circle in this class, from the expressions of the divine right of ancient Near Eastern kings in these nearly 4,000-year-old sculptures, both of which are in the collection of the Louvre, works of propaganda made of stone and closely guarded today, and that allow viewers to only take away photos and memories, to not touch, to a work of art collaboratively produced by hundreds of people that destabilizes a site expresses of power intended for a diverse public audience of regular folks who destroyed the physical work, a work of art now only existing in photographs. What a journey we've been on this semester, from art intended to reinforce the power of the ruler to art that finishes its life cycle at the hands of the public. These works are products of their context, their time and place, and hopefully you now feel empowered to learn or tell the stories of objects that are meaningful to you.